Hello, good morning everyone. Happy National Apprenticeship Week. I hope you've been enjoying the week so far and uh, a very warm welcome to our round table today which is entitled Building the Future Post-Pandemic Apprenticeships. As you uh, are perhaps aware, the theme for National Apprenticeship Week this year is Build the Future, hence the title. And uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of the fantastic benefits that apprenticeships bring. Uh, my name is Crawford Knott, I'm Managing Director of Port Training and we support uh, thousands of apprentices up and down uh, England across a range of different vocational sectors. Uh, everything from business administration to team leading management to early years to warehousing and storage, uh, trade supplier, customer service to name but a few. And we're actually based in Twickenham in West London. I'm actually joining you from a rather chilly Shepparton this morning. I hope the weather is fine for you where you are and also that you're keeping well in these very strange times. Just a bit of housekeeping just before we get going. Please could you just ensure that you're kept on mute unless you wish to speak. You can also use the chat function as well if you want to comment or ask any questions as we go. You can also, as we go on to um, sort of a wider discussion, uh, actually come on camera and speak if you're feeling particularly brave. So please do feel free to use the raise hand function on Teams uh, if you would like to do that. I think we've all become very well versed in a range of different video conferencing packages since obviously you know what's happened to us over the past almost year now, everything from Zoom to Teams to Google Hangout. So hopefully uh, you know you're 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 sort of all you know fully versed with this package. Uh, but if we do have any issues at all, uh, we will actually be recording this session. So if for any reason you don't wish to appear in the recording, if you could let us know on chat, that would also be great. And we can actually edit that out, I'm sure, after this. Uh, I'm delighted to see so many of you uh, joining us today from a range of different organisations. I can see we've got people from local authorities, NHS trusts, schools, employers and so on. So uh, once again, a very warm welcome. In terms of the key discussion points, which you should have received by now, we're going to be looking at really how the pandemic has impacted on apprenticeship programmes. What lessons have we learned that can inform the delivery, supply and take up of apprenticeships? And also, what does the future look like in terms of apprenticeships and wider opportunities on that whole sort of post pandemic world as and when we finally get there? At this point, I'd just like to ask uh, Richard Scott to, to join me on screen, if you wouldn't mind, Rich. Morning. Hello, hello. And I can also see Susan and, and Manira, you've also got your cameras on. That's fantastic. Very warm welcome to, to all of you. Um, Rich, how are you? You well? Yeah, very well. Thanks, Crawford. Excellent. Um, I just wonder if you could give us a, a bit of an intro into uh, you know, your organisation, your role, how you're involved in apprenticeships, and, and then we can sort of just work through those questions, if that's OK, if you wouldn't mind just kicking us off. Yeah, no, absolutely no problem. Um, apologies for the lighting in my office here at home today. For some reason, the the bright sunshine is not quite um, striking my face, so um, I do apologise. And if I put the light on it, it's not going to benefit us at all anyway. Um, so just by way of introduction, my name's um, Rich and I'm the HR director for a company called um, HML. Um, now, HML is um, an organisation that manages um, big blocks of flats, basically, um, very much of, um, you know, uh, an area that's in the news at the moment and um, everything that you see on the news and that's going on in, in the House of Parliament at, at the moment affects us as an organisation. Um, I've been with the organisation since, what, 2015 now. Um, and when I first joined the organisation, we actually didn't have any apprenticeships or apprentices in the organisation. Um, tell a lie, there might have been a few sporadic ones sort of um, spread across the business, but you could probably count it on, on one hand. Um, and I went on a journey because I'm a, a very passionate believer in um, you know, bringing people in um, on apprenticeships into organisations to to then train and develop them um, within the sort of structure of the organisation. So I've always been a passionate believer in in apprenticeships. Um, and we started an apprenticeship apprenticeship program. Um, worked with um, Hawk Training, um, and I'm sort of pleased to sort of say I, I ran the numbers this morning actually, Crawford. Um, since 2017, so that's when it really started ramping up for us, of course, that's when the levy came in. Um, we've had 77 apprentices 
um, in the organization. And our organization is not massive, really um, 450 um, in size. So um, yeah, something I'm very proud of. Um, our managers have really embraced it. Um, we've had some fantastic yeah, people got it, got it, got it. join the organization. Um, many of which are still here, which is fantastic. And I think one of them's on this particular call today as well. Fantastic. And yeah, I know you've been, um, I think, walked the chip switch. And you've also been very modest because I know you're also a top 100 apprenticeship employer nationally, which is also a great <laughs> accolade to have. Um, I just wanted to ask, how have you found the, the pandemic in terms of its impact on, on the apprenticeship programme? What, what have been the, uh, the repercussions of that? Yeah, no, I was just... Well, this was quite interesting, to be honest, Crawford. So um, I think like any organisation, when the pandemic hit, there was a um, a big sort of readjustment on, on how we worked as an organisation. And, and it was pretty much overnight getting everyone out of the office environment into working from home. And initially we did, um, again, I think like many other organisations, we did sort of adopt and use the furlough sort of programme. Um, because we didn't quite know what was going on and, and how it was all going to sort of work. And, and our apprentices and many of our apprentices were actually furloughed. But once everything calmed down, um, we actually brought them back into the the, the workplace um, and they just carried on as normal. Um, you know, we only furloughed um, a small percentage overall of the organisation. However, because they were apprentices, um, you know, they, they were the ones that we we felt we needed to be more interactive and more sort of working with them, um, you know, closely. Um, but you guys obviously helped us in, in overcoming that, where we sort of up the actual study time for, for the apprentices so they could do um, their study rather than the working side of stuff. And as I say, once everything calmed down, back into the workplace and they just carried on as normal. You know, we've got no one on, on furlough now um, from an apprenticeship point of view. And this year, it seems to be a bit of a spike. I think we're in the process of recruiting another four into the business uh, as we speak. Um, and it's just been business as usual, if I'm completely honest, Crawford. Brilliant. And it's great to hear, really. Do you think there's any lessons that have been learned that could perhaps inform the, de the demand supply of apprenticeships in future and, and, and the take up? Um, you know, I'm, I'm always fascinated, really, just to sort of gauge, you know, the level of awareness of apprenticeships, not just with employers, but also among young people and, and, and schools and so on. Do you think there's anything that perhaps we've learned over this pandemic that will perhaps have a maybe a, a positive impact on, on some of these areas? That's a good question. I mean, I I, I genuinely, um, and, and you will know this better Hi. than I, I do, Crawford, I genuinely think there's been a huge shift in the perception of apprenticeships within, within the UK. I mean, I remember... Um, it was probably about 10 years ago when I first started working with, with Hawk. Um, it, it was very hard for people to even understand what an apprenticeship was. And there was all these sort of perceptions about what an apprentice is. Now I feel we've come full sort of circle and, it, and it's almost, you know, everyone is aware of what an apprenticeship is, how it works, um, the model, how you can develop under the structure, the, the different avenues as well that are open. You know, we've got an apprenticeship in property management, for example, um, only came out three or four years ago under the sort of trailblazer sort of scheme. Um, that wasn't there, you know, five, six, seven years ago. And it, it is it is fantastic to see all these different opportunities that are now uh, available and open to people. And the other thing we're starting to see a shift in as, as well, Crawford, is, um, you know, we are getting those university graduates now who, who are coming out of university, who are, you know, trying to get their, their foot in the door or, or getting into the workplace. And you know what? We still use the apprenticeship scheme for them. You know, we're still putting them through um, our apprenticeships in property management, for example. So we know they've got the, the base knowledge and the skills to really sort of have a good foundation in the organisation. Um, so I, I'm probably, you know, I, I suppose I, I I see only benefits and positives with the apprenticeship programme and I can only see it building on from strength to strength. You know, we hear um, schools talking about apprenticeships a lot more than they ever did, careers fairs, etc. You know, I'm very passionate about it and I've also seen a massive change in, in what's going on um, with the perception of apprenticeships. 
That's fantastic. And I, I know you've continued to recruit apprentices, as you've, as you've said, through the pandemic as well, Rich. And do you think, I mean, sort of outside the, the apprenticeship programme and, and other areas, um, what do you think the future is going to look like in terms of sort of employment opportunities? I know as an organisation, you're based not a million miles from where we are in Twickenham. Uh, you're, you're over in Richmond. Have you seen um, any sort of like regional trends or, or, or differences in different parts of London or, or, or indeed different parts of the country at all? Um, I must admit, um, it's always been um, more, what's the word, um, uh, successful um, with our apprenticeships in the southeast of England, um, London. And whether or not that's our partnership with you, um, I, I, I don't quite know. But whenever we st we try and lift the scheme and say recruit up in, in, in Nutsville, we've got an office up there in Bolton, um, it, it's a lot more difficult but I, I suppose my my gut is it's because we've got that relationship. And, and like you said, you're just down the road. Um, you know, there's a good trust and there's a good sort of rapport that's built between the two organisations. Um, you know, we know if we come knocking on your door, you'll be able to recruit someone effectively into our roles. Um, so I suppose I do see those sort of regional variations, but I don't know whether or not that is because um you know we've got that you know good working relationship with you guys that it's just more beneficial in the london and southeast of england yeah i think it, it is interesting I, I know when we've recruited for apprentices in, in different parts of the country quite often um you know the, the take-up for, for whatever reason has been better in london than i've found in for example as other cities um manchester being a, a case in point um, I, I think it really goes back to that whole information advice and guidance function that young people also get in schools. And uh, we've recently had a white paper released, uh, the Skills for Jobs white paper. And I think one of the things that really comes out of that, which is, is I, I think, a great idea, is also um, ensuring that students from year seven are aware of vocational technical pathways. Um, and really the value of those alongside, you know, every bit as good as the, the academic pathways. Um, and I think that's great that if we can get the message out there earlier with young people, then hopefully, you know, we, we'll see a change there as well. But in, in terms of the future, you, you've obviously said, Rich, you continue to uh, recruit apprentices and so on. Um, do you think that you'll be recruiting them in, in, in greater numbers, lesser numbers as a, as a result of the pandemic? What's your view? Um, I, I think we would we'll maintain at our current sort of, um, you know, what, what I would say is a high level. Um, uh, I, again, I, I don't know whether or not we're unique in this, but I, you know, as an employer, we pay um, apprentices, you know, 60% um, above the apprenticeship minimum wage, for example. So we really sort of invest at a high level straight away to show our commitment um, into those roles. And they also go into proper, proper job roles, you know, established job roles within the organisation. Um, so at the end of their apprenticeship, they just carry on with their employment. Of course, they get a pay rise after completing their apprenticeship, but they just carry on with their employment, um, you know, with us. So I, for me, I see it as um, continuing with the same established number of apprentices that, that we have. Um, and Absolutely. I'm always open, you know, as soon as a manager says, can I recruit an apprentice? We've never said no. Um, and another thing I'm quite proud of is, as well is, um, you know, our, our levy our levy pot um it's actually a hr kpi where i'm on a mission to overspend the levy pot so i can come knock in for that co-funding with with government um and that i set out back in 2017 to do that we've achieved it um, and we carry on to do that because um you know why should i pay for the training when actually i could pay it with the government to help us out as well so you know recruiting more apprentices for example Fantastic. There's, there's a question actually uh, just come through as well um, from Dawn Anderson. If uh, someone is already a graduate and have a degree, would there be difficulty in them being eligible for a second degree on an apprenticeship with HML? So I, our um, property management apprenticeships um, start off or commence at a level three. Um, so it, we don't badge it as a graduate program that's not the right sort of word but we we will recruit graduates who are interested in the property market and want to get into to property management um, however to bring them in they do come in at that level three and work through our apprenticeship framework 
um, at a level three. They can obviously go up to a level four as well at, on completion of that particular apprenticeship. Um, so we've never had problems with with funding that, um, you know, because they've already got a degree. Fantastic. And uh, this is obviously National Apprenticeship Week, and it'd be fantastic also just to hear from an apprentice themselves. I know we've got Nathan Scutchings on the call today, who is one of uh, Richard's apprentices at, at HML. Nathan, would you uh, would you mind just sort of switching your camera on and taking yourself off mute, please? Hi. How are you? Are you well? I'm not too bad, thank you. How are you? Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Happy National Apprenticeship Week and a very warm welcome to you, Nathan. Where are you joining us from today? So I'm um, based out of Luton. Um, I come from Luton originally. So, yeah. Brilliant. And uh, thank you for giving us your time today. Um, it'd be great to hear from, from you directly, really, Nathan, just to, to ask you that question. Um, how has the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, impacted on your apprenticeship and, and you know, your experience? OK, so um, unlike what Richard said, um, I was fortunate to be one of the apprentices that wasn't furloughed. Um, so I came straight out of our Luton office and I came straight into a working from home environment, which I'd never done before. I'd only been in the apprenticeship, I think about three, four months, to be honest. So I spent most of my apprenticeship working from home, which it was a bit of a change as to my idea of how everything was gonna plan out. But at the same time, realistically, I feel like there was very little change in what actually was going to happen to what actually occurred so i was very fortunate i had a uh, amazing tutor from you who was very um kind and considerate of the actual circumstances and we planned and worked out all around um, the pandemic really and then in my actual um work approach i was very fortunate as well where i was in a situation where i had everything i needed to be able to work from home effectively and kind of complete my apprenticeship and develop myself in the role at the same time. And do you think, what sort of lessons do you think have been learned perhaps over the pandemic? As you said, you know, you, you started off in the office environment, you've gone to working from home, um, which obviously has is, been a new thing for so many people. I mean, myself included, really, and having to sort of juggle everything at home as well as obviously, you know, you, you're sort of working day. Do you think there's any lessons that we've perhaps learned over the pandemic just to sort of help, uh, you know, address issues around demand for apprenticeships, the supply of them or, or, or take up amongst amongst particularly young people? Um, I personally feel um, from myself and from the people around me that there's been more of a drive on apprenticeships as um, us young people. We are like the future of quite a few big large organizations and I know myself and the people around me we all feel that we are being challenged but this challenge is putting us in a position where a couple years down the line there might be some of us that are like the top people in these companies managers everything and I feel like this actual pandemic has kind of shaped like the way it's going in the sense of we've got more of a drive in investing in the young people in these major companies and these smaller companies alongside them. I think that's really a really good point and, 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 and fantastic to hear as well because obviously we're aware of you know so many of the, the negatives that have come out of the pandemic but it's also great to hear of the positives and you know I, I hope as I'm sure many of you do this on this round table today that we sort of really learn the lessons I think um, of this pandemic in, in more ways than one. And um, you, it's really interesting that you're saying there's, there's more of a drive. Um, in terms of the future for apprenticeships and, and wider employment, do you feel sort of optimistic then? Um, do you think there's going to be many more people looking at apprenticeships, perhaps who maybe wouldn't have considered them in, in the past? Um, in my opinion, I think there will be. Um, I. I think we have seen a trend recently of less people actually going into university and more going directly into learning on the job roles and apprenticeship roles. And I feel like this is only going to accelerate that 
even further and create more of a drive for people to actually get out there, get into the workplace and learn while they're working. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'd agree with that. And also, I mean, I'm not sure what your view is, but I think a lot of people will also be looking at apprenticeships even more so because if you look at, let's say, for example, many people's current experience over the last year of university education, many may well be thinking, well, look, I'm incurring a debt of £9,000 a year. If I'm not, you know, actually in a university environment, I'm, I'm learning from home, then, you know, I, I could I could do that anywhere. So I, I really agree with that. Um, that's fantastic, Nathan, to, to hear, I think, directly from, from yourself. And I'd, I'd invite all of the, the speakers today and, and anyone, you know, if, if you want to make a point at any time, please, please do come on and, you know, unmute yourself or switch on your camera if that's not already switched on. Vanira, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. We'll come back to you shortly. How are you, Manira? Hi, sorry. I was just um, uh, finding my mute button. <laughs> I never thought I'd have found it by now. Yeah, right. Uh, apologies. I got slightly distracted at the same time by a message. But uh, thank you very much for inviting me, Wilford. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, I'm, I'm sure most people on, on, the, on the call today will know who you are. It would be great if you could just sort of int introduce yourself. Oh, fantastic. Yes, of course. Um, so I'm Munira Wilson. I'm the Member of Parliament for Twickenham. I got elected in December 2019, um, succeeding Sir Vince Cable, who I'm sure many of you knew because when he was uh, Business Secretary, I know he was championing apprenticeships a huge amount and I know he's done a lot of work with Hawk Training, um, given that they're based in the constituency. So um, thank you very much for organising this event uh, and inviting me. Um, Today. You're very welcome. Thanks for giving us uh, your time. I just wondered if uh, you just perhaps wanted to respond to some of the points that uh, you know Richard and uh, Nathan have talked us through. Yeah, well, I was I was really encouraged to hear what Richard and Nathan were saying because as I was sort of uh, doing a little bit of research, knowing that I was coming here today, I, I felt that there was a lot of doom and gloom around uh, apprenticeships in the sense of. The, the impact on numbers as a result of the pandemic. I mean, uh, it, it's great that there's such a brilliant new story from HML, but the, the, the numbers that I've found suggested that there has you know, the number of apprenticeships pretty much halved between March and May 2019 and March and May 2020. We know here in Twickenham, the numbers have plummeted uh, as well over the last year. Um, and you know, six in ten, ten employers have stopped all apprenticeships. So I'm delighted to hear that there are good news stories out there because I was really concerned reading these numbers and trends. And we know in the local area in Richmond Borough, um, unemployment among 18 to 24 year olds has gone up by 229% um, since March 2020. So uh, it, the pandemic has particularly uh, hit uh, both children and young people and young adults very, very hard. And, and I'm really concerned about how we address that and make sure that, that as we uh, hopefully start to turn a corner now that vaccination rates are going up and as a result of the gains that we've made from the latest uh, lockdown, that we can, uh, how we start to fire up the economy again and encourage and incentivize employers to create more apprenticeships. And I, um, I think, you know, what Nathan was saying about actually, I think universities degrees are becoming less attractive because of the cost, but also because uh, COVID has massively negatively impacted the university experience. Um, and let's face it. And it was it's interesting uh, before um, the pandemic uh, started last year when I was a very new MP, I went down to visit um, NPL, the National Physical Laboratory, which is in the constituency down in Teddington and met some apprentices there. And there were quite a few who, you know, might otherwise, uh, you might otherwise have expected them to follow a traditional route from school into university, but had chosen to go the apprenticeship route and massively valued it. And actually some then subsequently decided to go to university and then they were finding um, that actually they were, they were far more highly skilled, particularly in those sciencey subjects than some of the you know some of the others but just because they would had that hands-on lab experience and it's interesting that Richard was saying that when you hire graduates that you're often putting them on apprenticeship so I'm quite interested to hear that feedback about um, you know universities perhaps not providing the right skills for the workplace I mean I I worked for a science and technology company before I became an MP and talking to 
um, a couple of our sites up in Scotland uh, that were that were lab based and, and hired large numbers of graduates. They were the complaint was often, you know, science graduates are not coming to us with the right lab skills. So I think there's a there's a real skills issue that needs to be uh, addressed there specifically. So that um, I mean, it's great that apprenticeships are, are obviously helping to address that. But from a university perspective, I think that, that should be sort of factored into to how some of the university degree courses are being um, designed. Um, I think just sort of you know, big picture as we start to uh, try and you know, rebuild and uh, you know, fire up the economy again, I would like us would like to see the government uh, investing heavily in, in in skills, but also in in green infrastructure, where I think a lot of the new jobs will come around this area. We know that aviation and travel have been massively hit in terms of unemployment, uh, and and you know I can't see that those sectors recovering quickly. And to be honest, I'm not sure if they will recover fully ever because I think we've all changed our lives so much in the way that we live our lives, the way we do business. I know you know, big corporates like the one I used to work for will have seen the the, the gains financially, not least, uh, from people not travelling every week to, to business meetings around the world and doing things virtually. So um, there is going to be, you know, we, we are going to see, I, I would have thought, more and more unemployment. So we need to be investing in, in um, green infrastructure in particular, and of course, tech and digital. And we've seen obviously a massive shift uh, in to, to digital in the way we work across so many different sectors, whether that's you know, every day in our lives, the fact we're doing this via Teams or Zoom, uh, but also particularly in healthcare, I'm the Lib Dem health, um, health spokesperson, I'm hearing all the time about uh, digital medicine and how that's transformed overnight. So I think there's some great opportunities there, but we need to be investing in those and providing greater incentives for uh, employers as uh, as um, the uncertainty lifts and we can see the light at the end of the tunnel to be investing in more apprenticeships. Just a, a couple of uh, um, comments about the local situation. Um, I know here in uh, Richmond Borough, I know the council has been uh, has set up a, a Richmond work match scheme to help match those who um, employers with those who are seeking roles. Um, so that uh, you know, should should apply as much to apprenticeships as other sorts of roles. Uh, and I know that they've established um, the, something called the Phoenix Enterprise Program, which is a Richmond business support program. And they've got various streams, one specifically targeted at hospitality, one at the creative sector, both of which in normal times are thriving in the borough and a more mainstream one for startups. So those of you who are employers in the local area, I would um, encourage you uh, to look at that. Um, but, you know, I'm just keen to, to hear from, I know there's lots of people on the call uh, to, to hear your feedback about some of the things that you think uh, I should be, the points I should be making to government as we seek to rebuild uh, post COVID and how we can really boost uh, apprenticeships. Uh, I think, I, I, I'm encouraged to hear what Nathan said. I do think some of the, uh, the, the sort of snobbery around, you know, the degree path is the way to go uh, is lifting. And we are seeing more and more people looking at apprenticeships and, and technical qualifications uh, as, as a route uh, beyond school. But I think there's a lot more we can do to, to champion those routes um, and to be more like some of the other European countries where actually a vocational path is just as highly valued uh, as an academic path post-school. Thanks, Maria. Thank you very much for that. And um, please do feel free to um, respond to Maria's request for feedback if there's anything you, you'd like to add on on the chat, or indeed, you know, if you want to come on later on on camera and uh, just give your view or, or make a few requests uh, to Maria, then that's uh, that'd be fantastic. Um, you talked also about incentives, Maria, which um, is I think a very hot topic and I can see we've got also a question on the chat because not only are there incentives for employers to take on a, a, apprentices so for example if it's a 16 to 18 year old it's two thousand pounds per apprentice if they're older that, that uh, amount uh, decreases slightly to one around about one thousand five hundred and so on for older learners but there are also a lot of different uh, government initiatives currently available so you know we've got kickstart we've got restart we've got traineeships we've got t levels and 
Susan Shaw of um, Richmond and Wands Wandsworth Borough Council is just asking actually on the chat, has the new Kickstart programme helped or hindered the apprenticeship programme? I can see you're, you're on cameras as well today, Susan. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, Rich, I just thought I'd throw that one over to you actually. Have you engaged with Kickstart? Have you found, it, have you found it's hindered the apprenticeship programme at all? Um, we, we're just starting to, um, with, with you guys, um, actually, on the Kickstart programme. Um, so I, I know you, you bid it for funding before Christmas, wasn't it? Before... Traineeships. It's around traineeships. So it's, it's ah, OK. And, and again, this is this the point go. I'm making. Yeah. There's so many different initiatives. It's, it's, it can sort of uh, be, could be a little uh, confusing. You know, I'm, I'm always thinking as I'm saying them, I've missed one out because there's so many of them. That, that, would, that would probably explain why um, my partner, she works for um, uh, Woken and Borough Council and she was talking about Kickstart and how they've already got their um, their people starting. And I turned around and said, oh, we're still waiting for the funding. I'm working with you know, all training on this. Uh, you hit the nail on the head there. You've explained why we, we got confused um, with each other because there is so many schemes out there. Oh, to take myself off mute. I, I think um, really my view is very much that all of these programmes, I know it's easier said than done, but they, they need to be integrated. So, you know, for example, if someone starts a Kickstart programme, it's a six month work placement and their salary effectively is, is paid for the first six months by government. But if, for example, that employer has an apprenticeship opportunity, as it currently stands, that individual still has to complete the Kickstart program for six months before they can then progress on to that apprenticeship opportunity. Wouldn't it make better sense if it was better integrated so that, let's say, for example, an employer like HML, you could then put that person on an apprenticeship, let's say, after two, three months if on the Kickstart program, if, uh, you know, the, obviously it's a good fit. And then for that salary then to be paid for the apprentice for the following, you know, four months or, or whatever it may be. And um, I think that that's that's one of the issues. There's a lot of really good initiatives out there, but you know, as as I said earlier, I think trying to kind of navigate it if you're um, an employer or if you're an individual looking to take up one of these opportunities, it can sometimes be a bit confusing. And I think what we do need, and one of the things which has been mentioned, is this single front door approach. So. If you are a person who's looking for an employment opportunity or kickstart, apprenticeship, traineeship, whatever that may be, then you've got one single point of information right. where you can go to actually get guidance on that as well. Um, Manira, I just wonder if you had a view on that, actually, just with, with these uh, different initiatives that we've got currently available. Well, I, only to say that I agree with you because I myself was wondering how Kickstart linked into apprenticeships and, and wondered if there was any formal link and there doesn't appear to be. So the fact that we've got all of these different things going off on, on twin tracks, I suspect, as you say, for both employers and uh, potential employees is, is, is not helpful. And that's a, a useful point for me. I've, I've made a note of it. And if I have the opportunity to, to, to raise it in any forum with, um, with, with policymakers and decision makers, I will do. Yeah, please do so. And I'm just talking about the programme that Richard mentioned before. So we're actually in a position now to offer traineeships in London for 19 to 24 year olds. Um, and a traineeship is really designed for individuals who are not uh, really far from the workplace, who don't perhaps need that intensive support to get them job ready. And it centres around the work placement as well as um, sort of more skills training around um, you know communication personal presentation maths english digital skills where required but at the moment one of the issues we're facing is obviously as workplaces are for the most part shut down um sourcing those work placements is probably to look at some sort of virtual work experience as well um which i know you know some organizations do facilitate organisations like Spark, local tours in West London and so on. Um, just moving to some of the uh, support for apprentices around sort of coaching and, and mentoring. Um, Mike Freely of Octink, and uh, I know Octink is also a, an excellent supporter of apprentices. They're based in, in Brentford and they've recruited a number of apprentices and also they're upskilling their existing staff with apprenticeship programmes, which uh, you can also do. But Mike's asking, and I'll put, I'll put this one over to you, Rich, in terms of 
uh, best practice on managing apprentices remotely who are working at home. Uh, for many employers, that can present a bit of a challenge. I just wonder what your thoughts on that were. Yeah, I think we, we, we've struggled um, without a doubt, and we're, we're certainly finding um, it's harder in lockdown 3.0. And, and I, you know, we, we are aware that it's impacted not only our apprentices, but, but everyone within the, the organisation as well. Um, how have we gone about it? Well, um, what, what we've done as an organisation is, is we use Teams. Um, yeah, you know, we encourage the sort of um, team sort of environment, the getting together, the sort of um, you know the manager and the the apprentice to you know spend that dedicated time on on Teams as well. Um, and I suppose it links into what I was saying about our approach to apprentices anyway. Um, that they're, they're seen as as very much part of the team. You know, they're doing a job function. They're doing a very important job function, um, and they're treated in that sort of vein. So. Um, you know, Nathan might be able to back me up on this one, but um, it, they're very much fully integrated. They are part of the team. They're part of the one sort of HML sort of ethos. Um, you know, we don't put all our apprentices off for a day's training in London, for example, or, um, you know, have a an academy that has all our apprentices in. Um, they are in the teams, working within the teams, and they are very much part of that team. Um, so perhaps, again, I... I I don't think we've had to adopt anything different to our apprentices versus our, um, you know, our, our permanent employees. Nathan, I just wonder what your view was on that. What, as an apprentice yourself, what do you think is uh, an effective way of, of supporting apprentices? Um, so, from my point of view and from my experience, um, obviously, as Rich said, like we are kind of adopted into the team almost as soon as you walk through the door. I know, especially I was. And um, within the current climate, I think the best way to, I think, get the best out of your apprentice really is to um, just, it's got to be about inclusion, inclusiveness. Um, I know for a fact that between me and my whole team, we probably spend about an hour, two hours a day on Teams, just talking about work, what's going on, as well as kind of personal stuff. And I think bringing the team together and this kind of almost team bonding, if you'd call it, um, does get the best out of the apprentice um, for the apprentice themselves and as well as I feel for the company as well. Uh, thanks for that. And I think it's, it's a really valid point you make. I know, you know, at Hawk, we've um, developed a number of programmes around sort of managing teams remotely emotional resilience and that type of thing as well so you know those, those programs are out there i think there's going to be a big piece around reintegrating people back into the workplace as and when it's safe to do so and um i just think you know that there's going to be a, a lot of um thought that needs to be given to that as well i mean we've come across quite a lot of individuals that have started their apprenticeship during the pandemic we've come across employers managers that have never actually physically met the team that they're managing because they've actually started during the pandemic and they're, and they're working from home and i can see susan susan Shaw. i can see you've got your hand up if you'd uh, would mind coming in that'd be fantastic if you could just introduce yourself and and where you're from sorry just unmuting myself yeah. Uh, hi, Susan Shaw, um, Business and Enterprise Manager from London Borough of Richmond. Um, I just wanted to make a point. Well, I, actually, I was the point about um, managing remotely are, are really critical. And we, I actually attended a session yesterday in the council about re, uh, managing agile workers, and it just reflecting all the things that you've just said. But uh, it is important to. Um, to focus on work, but also to focus on non-work things, just giving yourself a break. And we've organised coffee breaks amongst cross directorates so that people from different directorates can get together and that, replacing those moments when you were at the coffee machine and you caught up on news. I mean, it's actually being able to do that. But uh, so, yeah, I, I, um, I support everything you said there. But I also wanted to go back and just say something about um, the plethora of... Uh, courses and uh, and schemes that are there you'd mentioned restart kickstart t levels traineeships and obviously apprenticeships and i'm just mindful of the sort of the uh 
quagmire we had with the business grant system in the council where you know people are so confused about the different types of grants that are available and the business rates team produced this wonderful chart color coded to help people through that maze and i wondered if somebody could come up with a, a great color coded chart for all these different schemes because that would help us to actually be able to promote it to the local business community. And as Munira said, we've got quite a few things running at the moment that you know uh, we could promote apprenticeships and all these schemes a lot more effectively if we, we had sort of something really concise and useful to share with people. We've got the Phoenix uh, Enterprise Program, which is running for um, general sort of early startups and early stage growth businesses there's a mainstream program for that we've got a separate one running for the creative industries and a separate one for the hospitality industry so that's running over the next year and we've got lots of uh, workshops and uh, uh, business clinics and uh, networking sessions so there's an opportunity to promote uh, apprenticeships amongst other things to this these groups of businesses that are coming through that program We've also got the South London Knowledge Exchange program that's running uh, across five boroughs in South London, and that's linking SMEs with the universities. And again, there's a whole group of people that will be involved in that program over the next three years. And although graduates are clearly you know, uppermost in the university's mind in terms of placing them within companies, there's also opportunities to promote apprenticeships and other schemes to these small companies coming through the what is the the business innovation and growth big uh, program being run by South London Knowledge Exchange. So lots of opportunities, I think, to get to the business community, but we need to have clear messages about what's on offer and to be able to differentiate between the different schemes and also how they access them and who they go to for more information. Because a lot of small companies, they don't know where to, particularly small companies rather than the larger ones, they don't know where to start and you know they need a bit of a helping hand to get onto these schemes to see if they're suitable. So that's uh, where I'm coming from. And also just to say finally, and I'll shut up, uh, the local authority is also doing its bit because we're we're busy restructuring our own economic development office uh, across the two boroughs in Richmond and Wandsworth, bringing them together to service the needs of businesses. And in this new structure, we've got about three or four apprenticeship. Uh, placements in there so we'll be working closely with Workmatch obviously on that and HR internally but you know we're, we're doing our bit as well for bringing in apprenticeships uh, into the new teams that we're creating that's it thanks well, thanks for your contribution Susan that's really, that's really useful, useful. Um, um, I think, I think um, um, sorry I'm just sorry, I'm putting myself back it's quite, quite scary, scary if you want to put, put yourself, yourself on mute, on mute. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, um, I, I know I, speaking, I know speaking uh, on a, a recent forum, actually, with the West London Alliance, I know DWP, Department of Work and Pensions, so the job centres, have actually started to put together almost like a schematic, as you say, a diagram, graph, you know, whatever you, you'd like to call it, of these different programmes for their colleagues. And I think it would be useful to perhaps roll that out more widely. Interestingly enough, I know what they're saying from the job centre perspective is they're starting to see now uh, claim levels stabilising because obviously there were a lot of people that were made redundant at the start of the pandemic and throughout who basically needed benefits and, and that's where the focus has been. But I know they are now just about sort of rolling out training to their staff so that they can give effective advice and guidance. But I think that's something that I could certainly circulate to everyone who's been on this uh, roundtable today and more widely but I think yeah the whole inform, uh, information advice and guidance piece is massive definitely um, I, there is also a question on here I thought I'd, uh, on chat I thought I'd uh, just pop this over to you Rich if you wouldn't mind as an employer uh, Dawn Anderson asks would there be any benefit of offering work experience stroke placements during the summer for graduates so that they gain real work experience from employers such as yourselves um, that's a good question, Obi. We we do we do get requests quite a lot for work experience, and and the the I suppose the 
the way that we approach it is we very much leave it to that sort of local office level and local sort of management level, um, you know, to, to organise that um, work experience. To be honest, I've not thought about doing um, a, a scheme specifically for graduates um, during the summer. I do recall a few years ago being part of a, a scheme, and uh, forgive me, I can't remember the, the name of it, where um, employers basically um, sponsored a college or an, an intake of um, college students. Um, and during the summer, we used to then do a paid sort of two months work experience. It wasn't paid highly or anything like that. And so I can't remember it. But we used to then go down and deliver business sort of skills and presentations, CV writing, interview skills and things like that. So it was a whole programme which was aimed at, um, uh, I suppose, the the pupils that are, are in the middle you know they're, they're not sort of um you know the rising stars are really sort of you know ed academically and um, brilliant and equally they, they weren't the ones that were um getting the additional sort of support because perhaps they were in foster care or things like that so it was that that middle band but um, i'd say I'd, I'd never say never um it, it's um just something that I haven't explored or haven't really thought about, um, you know, as a formal sort of scheme. I suppose, again, just developing that, I know I'm rambling a bit on this one. Um, you know, we've actually tried to actively engage with universities as well that that are uh, training or, or developing um, people that we think would be suited to our particular, um, you know, industry. Um, it hasn't gone very well, if I'm completely honest, because we thought, yeah, you know, that'd be a talent pool that we can bring into the all to the organisation. And you also tend to find now that these um, universities are also advertising apprenticeships as something that they will deliver as well, which I've found, you know, extremely sort of fascinating. Um, and the other thing that we've struggled personally as a business when we engage directly with universities um, is actually the skills they're, they're getting. They're getting a the nice rounded sort of academic sort of skill and they might touch lots of different sort of sectors within within the housing sort of sector uh, and real estate but our apprenticeships are the, the ones that are actually built around our industry which is really linked to our property management of blocks um, of flats out in the community and they really do deliver the skills and um, you know the, the qualifications that we need as an industry sector so sorry I went a, a bit around the houses on that one but um I would never say never, of course not, but it's not something I've I've actively looked at in the summer. Sure. And Munira, in your previous career uh, in industry, when you worked in the pharmaceutical sector, was this something that was mooted or, or, or put into practice? Work experience for graduates during summer holidays? Um, to be honest, it wasn't something that we did much of, no. I mean, what my last employer did um, was they started up, uh, and I know this isn't unusual for many big companies, but it was for, for this company, was starting up a, a graduate program um, whereby they, they, they took uh, graduates on, on a sort of one year contract and, and provided them you know, with hands on experience uh, in, in a particular department. But we didn't really do work experience um, other than, you know, the usual sort of a, a couple of colleagues may have a friend who wanted, you know, their child to come and have experience, which I'm always a bit uncomfortable about because obviously that just means if you've got the right contacts and connections, then you're getting exposure to, to, to work experience as opposed to it being a level playing field. So um, I, th I think the problem, the challenge with uh, work experience quite often is if somebody's coming in for a very short amount of time, um, can they meaningfully do anything or is it just a case of shadowing? And so I think a lot of employers perhaps don't necessarily see uh, the, the need for investment uh, of their time in, in, in individuals. Right, you're wrong, Lee. I'm just trying to give you that, that sort of perspective. Um, I mean, I get, as an MP, as you can imagine, I get lots and lots of young people contacting me on a regular basis asking for work experience or, and indeed people just wanting to volunteer because they support me and they support the, the, the issues that I'm championing. Um, but 
it, you know, for us, there's always a problem of, of how you how you manage that, and that that takes manpower within the team, and particularly if you're a small team as as mine is, how do you, how do you oversee that and manage that so that the person who's asking for the work experience or wanting to volunteer gets something out of it, but so do you as the employer. Sure, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, just changing tack slightly, uh, I can see it's a question from Melanie Jackson. She says at the start of the pandemic, there was an article in the test, the Times Education Supplement, that a large number of training providers were going to liquidation. Um, am I concerned with the demise of more uh, training providers as this will reduce the number of traineeships and apprenticeships available and the, and the potential negative impact on young people? and uh, their opportunities. I think it is cause for concern, Melanie. Yeah, definitely. Um, people and government often talks about FE colleges. They don't always mention independent training providers, but as an independent training provider sector, we actually deliver 70% of apprenticeships throughout the country. And uh, yeah, it is concerning when you do hear of private providers going into liquidation and particularly for the learners and the employers also, but the learners who are left kind of in some cases in limbo. Uh, the Education Skills Fund, the AHC, does have a, uh, a team that work on learner transfers, so they will contact providers like us, uh, basically to match us up with learners who are, who are looking for a new provider. Um, you can see the little three zero up in the corner. We've been around for 30 years and hopefully we'll be around for, for many years. But um, I think there is probably a case, um, not across the board, but definitely for some form of grant funding to be made available to private providers. Uh, in the same way that colleges also receive grants. But I think it has to be very uh, discretionary and also based on track record and performance. Um, because, you know, sadly, we do sometimes hear of horror stories of private providers that are set up for the wrong reasons. And, you know, the employers and the, and the learners aren't getting the experience that they deserve and, and need, really. So I think it's very important to ensure the quality. I mean, we are ofsted -ed. you know, we're inspected by Ofsted. Uh, but currently there's 1,250 providers on the register of apprenticeship training providers. And I'm pleased to hear that that number is going to be reduced based on the fact that if um, these providers are not delivering apprenticeships, if they haven't started people in the last six months, then they'll start to be removed from that register, which I think also needs to happen because, again, going back to this point of confusion and brand messaging, employers you know, and learners sometimes are hearing it from a lot of different quarters and a lot of different organisations and it's important to ensure that consistency of message. Um, another question here for Dawn, from Dawn Anderson which I was going to actually pass over to you Susan if you wouldn't mind and Dawn is asking many apprenticeships are per borough um, for their own residents and Dawn wonders if it could be made that if a candidate lives or studied in, in that borough that uh, they could apply not just reside or potentially to share apprenticeships across neighbouring boroughs. And I just wondered if you if you had a had a view on that at all, Susan. I know we've seen this sometimes, sometimes with, uh, with uh, authorities, authorities recruiting only the residents in their borough, which is understandable. But I just wonder if you had a view on that. Susan? Susan? Yeah, I'm just got my headphones to try and get the echo out. Um, Yes, I mean, we take a view on that in terms of our business support programs. And, um, you know, we like to see that people who are signing up for the for our um, funded programs either live or are intending to set up a business in, in Richmond. So I think, um, you know, there are merits of looking at a sort of slightly wider field, uh, even in apprenticeships. But certainly we apply that. We try to apply as wide a band as we can. To, to those uh, participating in our in our business support programme so that it encompasses not just people who who reside here, but also people who might live somewhere else but want to set up a business in Richmond. So that's about probably the best I can say. So I, I don't see why, you know, a wider, slightly wider application couldn't apply to the apprenticeships as well. well thanks for that. Uh, Rich, did you have a, a view on this? Are you, um, do you have any sort of stipulation regards employing local residents uh, you know where the your offices or sites are based at all no not generally no i mean we we've got a massive headcount um you know two big offices down in croydon so so we do have a relationship with the croydon college um but but we don't stipulate no where they come from you know we're, we're very much 
you know, give us the candidates, let's have the CVs, let's speak to these candidates, and then we engage, um, you know, the right sort of, I suppose, person for our organisation. So that's how we approach it. Oh, fantastic. I just wanted to kind of go back to this uh, topic, and we've heard it mentioned a number of times, the information advice and guidance piece. And uh, Nathan, I just thought as we sort of draw into the end of this roundtable, it'd be great just to hear again from, from an apprentice. Were you told about apprenticeships at school at all? How did you find out about them? Right. So I feel when I was at school, when I was especially in high school, it was there was still kind of this almost stigma attached to apprenticeships of you do an apprenticeship if you're not smart enough to go to university kind of thing which obviously is completely false completely wrong like some of the smartest people I know don't go to university they're doing apprenticeships down in London um but I know especially uh, when I was in sixth form um they were pushing people to go to university like I was forced to write a personal statement and apply to universities that I didn't want to go to because I, I just knew I didn't want to go to university and I was kind of sat there and forced to do so. And the only person that I clearly recall telling me about apprenticeships was my tutor at the time, um, who literally sat me down and said, Nathan, I know you don't want to do your personal statement. I know you don't want to apply to unis. Like, I completely understand that what we're going to do is we're going to sit there and we're going to go through apprenticeships and find what you want to do. And I feel she was the only real person that sat there and did explain like apprenticeship roles to me. Whereas like, I know for a fact, like my entire school and my entire college, we weren't really exposed to it as per se. It was very kind of, you only found out about it if you kind of outright refused to go to university almost. Yeah, I, I think um, there's been a lot of progress been made, but there's definitely some way to go. I, I mean, back in the day when I, I sort of attended apprenticeship graduations in person, when you could do that sort of thing, hopefully those days will return soon. I always ask apprentices, you know, how many of you were told about apprenticeships at school? And typically, in my experience, it's around about 10%. Uh, it, it, it is, you know, it's still a minority. So, you know, I think we've still got some way to go in terms of messaging. And really also, you know, um, ensuring that people are aware of the different options that are open to them, because, you know, people have met, you've mentioned degrees and others on, on the on the round table today. And you can actually do a degree level apprenticeship now at level six. You don't need to go to university. You can continue to to learn while you learn. Um, Dawn Anderson's just got asking on chat, Nathan, did you have a personal connections or, or, or careers advisor independently working in your school? See, um, we did. Um, however, as I recall it, our career advisor was never in. Um, I remember you book a meeting with her and you turn up to the meeting and she wasn't there. So that's that's what I recall of it, at least. Right. That's uh, unfortunate and an unfortunate uh, experience, I think. There, I think also hopefully the Baker Clause which was introduced uh, a number of years ago now, which basically mandates that schools have to let their students know about vocational and, and technical pathways. I believe, and also this is raised in a recent government white paper, um, this whole process is going to have more teeth. So, you know, schools will be taken to task more if they're not uh, informing their students about vocational technical pathways, such as apprenticeships, which can only be a good thing. That leads us very nicely up to uh, almost half 12. I just wanted to really Thank everyone for, for joining us. So Richard, Nathan, Munira, thanks also for your contribution, Susan. Thank you to everyone also who's contributed to the discussion on chat. I wish you a very happy rest of National Apprenticeship Week. It does actually run till Sunday, so we've still got a couple of days. And uh, I wish you all uh, you know, the very best and, and, and keep very well. Do let us know at any time if you, you feel there's anything that uh, Hawk Training might be able to assist with. And uh, in the meantime, as I say, I'd just like to wish you all a very happy weekend. Thank you for your time today to all the speakers. And thank you also for joining us at home or if you are in the office, wherever you may be. So thanks once again. Uh, well, we will be circulating also, the recording. Just, sorry, Munira, yes, before you sign off, Sorry, before you sign off, could we do a quick screenshot photo? Absolutely, yes. Who are willing to? Yeah, if you would like to uh, take yourselves off, uh, basically switch your cameras on is what I'm saying. That'd be fantastic.
Hopefully you're not feeling particularly camera shy. <laughs> we'll see a few familiar faces. That's brilliant, thank you. No, thanks, Manu, and please do share it on social media, tag us, and we will uh, we'll include that as well and make sure it gets retweeted, shared. So once again, thank you, everyone. Take good care of yourselves and hope to see you all very soon, if not online, then in person when it's safe to do so. All the best. Bye-bye now. Thank you. All the best. Bye-bye.